Hi guys, I'm Diva. And I'm Avni. And welcome to Positionality, where today we're going to be talking about fast fashion. So I've heard fast fashion being talked about recently in um, both, I would say, like mainstream media as well as like on Instagram platforms, especially. I would say like I have the most basic understanding (laughs) of it. So like, do you want to go ahead and explain what it is and stuff? Yeah, I think the majority of people know what it is and that it's bad, Mm -hmm. but that's about it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's getting enough coverage in mainstream media, even though it's, like, been talked about a lot more. Yeah, so in case you guys don't know, fast fashion is essentially a profitable business model, which essentially works about works around replicating catwalk trends and high fashion designs and mass producing them at low cost, which are affordable to the general public. The way that it works is that a lot of designer brands like Gucci or Louis Vuitton will create a lot of well-made designs that they release a few times a year in something called Seasons, which I'm sure you guys have heard of. When collections are released and presented on runways, though, a lot of this stuff is posted on social media, which I'm sure you've seen, especially with, you know, like how Rihanna recently did a fashion show. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works is that design teams for fast fashion brands will see these designs and copy them and sell them for one-tenth of the original price with none of the quality of the original. So literally, like, any school project ever? (laughs) Basically. (laughs) But basically, is it... um, So from what I'm hearing, it's basically like a lifestyle, right? Like, they're trying to sell this lifestyle of, like, the elite rich and kind of, like, making it more accessible to the general public, which I guess is, like, a common theme that we've seen in, like, consumer revolutions like the market revolution the industrial revolution um and some other revolution i'm sure like the 1950s one yeah essentially they're selling the clothing of the elite and the rich but without any of the material the good like quality materials to back it up Mm -hmm. so because of fast fashion making all of these designer types of clothing affordable People have been buying a lot more clothes. In the 1980s, the average American bought 12 new articles of clothing every year. You know what they buy now? What? 68. Dude, that is so (laughs) much. Okay, I honestly can't even complain. I've been doing this, like, I was doing this up till, like, quarantine. I've been buying, I bought so many clothes. And I'm pretty sure most of them are from fast fashion brands because I, yikes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. a lot of the most popular clothing is from fast fashion brands. Stuff like Fashion Nova, Topshop, H&M, Zara, Forever 21. Brands that basically everyone has heard of and has probably bought at least something from. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think the real issue with this increased buying of clothes is that compared to 20 years ago, we're only keeping the clothes half as long. Yeah, there's definitely like stuff in my closet that it's kind of like I just don't wear anymore. And I feel like it's this whole trend of like, you know how there's this weird mindset where you can't wear the same outfit twice, definitely. which I think is messed up because that's so stupid. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to any fashion guru I offended, but like, no. No. <laughs> absolutely not um but it's kind of like that entire trend makes you kind of shove everything and like keep on buying stuff and like creates a demand that you don't really need yeah and the only thing that can fulfill that demand is fast fashion brands Mm -hmm. i think another issue is that even though fashion has grown tremendously from a 500 billion dollar trade to a 2.4 trillion dollars a year trade whoa the issue is that at least in the u.s the amount of clothing we're actually manufacturing has actually decreased huh so currently only about two percent of clothing u.s shoppers buy is made in the u.s the other 98 is imported dude (laughs) (laughs) I mean, like, 
I don't know. It's kind of interesting because, like, we see this with the U.S.-China trade war where President Trump is like, oh, buy, we're going to put tariffs on Chinese products because we want to encourage American consumerism of American stuff, right? And obviously that's, like, in a different context. But, like, I'm surprised we don't have more brands or, like, more clothing manufacturers in the or, like, clothing ma- manufacturing in the U.S. because this seems, like, way more profitable, than like a ton of industries definitely and like the reason that people are so upset about like the lack of you know homegrown clothing that we have is because up until 1970 america produced at least 70 percent of its clothes that americans bought what happened (laughs) (laughs) essentially fast fashion in the 1980s fast fashion cropped up And, you know, the production of these trendy, cheap clothing garments, there was no point in buying clothing from the U.S. when it could be made much more cheaply when it was offshored. Mm -hmm. And, like, we can see the trend of after the 1980s, it's, like, rapidly decreased. In in 1991, around 56% of all clothes bought in the U.S. were made in the U.S., but by 2012... It was 2.5%. Whoa. That's... Between that time, U.S. textile and garment mm-hmm. industry lost 1.2 million jobs. More than three quarters of the sector's lab- labor force was sent to Latin America and Asia. Dang. That is so much. And the biggest issue is that this isn't going to stop because offshoring manufacturing will always result in lower prices for brands, even if the brands are based in the U.S. And, like, Mm -hmm. obviously, common consumers favor this because they'll always want more clothes, even if their household, that for cheap prices, even if their income is pretty high. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'd assume you'd want clothes. (laughs) (laughs) I think most people do. (laughs) Um, But then the second part is, like, there the, there's this whole like i feel like with fashion specifically there's this whole trend setting phenomenon where it's like you always need to have the new stuff i mean that's with almost every industry like iphones <laughs> and stuff like that but um it's almost like oh you need to have this specific especially with like different aesthetics and like all these different celebrities pushing for different um i guess like iconic looks yeah it seems like it seems more and more prevalent in the fast fashion industry especially with social media just making that even worse i mean people Mm -hmm. are terrified of posting a picture which with an outfit that's already been posted which like that shouldn't be a thing but it is i know and it's ironic because like weirdly fat like celebrities kind of help like the normal people consumers like get super into the whole fast fashion industry but at the same time it seems like the fast fashion industry is taking away a lot of stuff um based on those brands like based on brand endorsements by celebrities yeah i mean a lot of the legacy brands they're not making as much profit as they used to because fast fashion is just so much cheaper and more accessible Mm mm-hmm um, just for context, legacy brands are like any of the luxury brands, I guess, or like, yeah. like Gucci. Gucci, yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, Louis Vuitton, Givenchy, all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff. You know, the stuff that yeah. normal people can't afford. Yeah, it's like the rich people stuff. <laughs> yeah, the celebrity <laughs> lifestyle. It's we funny because before fast mm-hmm. fashion, this obviously wasn't the case, but you know, with like the Regan Revolution, which emphasized a lot of free trade, it encouraged brands to offshore their production to Mm -hmm. countries in Asia, for example. And of course, this resulted in fewer jobs in the US. So like this prompted, you know, unions and trade groups to fight against job loss, and they made something called quick response manufacturing. Basically, this was created by the U.S. Apparel Manufacturing Association to compete against imports from low-cost labor markets. The way that this model works is that brands will test looks 
with smaller focus groups to see what's going to be successful before they submit production orders. And they'll make those orders smaller and more frequent, and reorders will only be placed when sales data indicates a need. Essentially, how fast fashion works. Huh. I feel like it's interesting because, especially with like the immigration rhetoric recently, where it's like, oh, these immigrants are coming in and taking our jobs or whatever, right? It's, it's more like these company, it's not that no immigrant is coming in and taking your job. You're, these companies are essentially outsourcing to other nations because of like cheap, what, whatever's be- beneficial to them. It's like capitalism is taking away your job. Essentially, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these companies, it's more favorable to them to give jobs to people who will work for less than the majority of people in the U.S. who expect higher wages. Mm-hmm. So, like, while quick response manufacturing is pretty similar to how fast fashion works today, it wasn't. It didn't become as, like, insane as it is now until a man named Amancio Ortega came into the scene. <laughs> so, this man decided to start a company called Zorba with his wife. I'm assuming nobody really knows what Zorba is. <laughs> yeah. Avni, do you know what it is? <laughs> um, wasn't it like... Wh- I think um, Hasan Minaj talked about it on his show Patriot Act, yeah. which is like a legend. But wasn't it like a bar or something? Or like, it was some sort of... <laughs> it was some sort yeah. of bar or something. And then they like they were like, dude, you are literally ripping off of us. This isn't even changing it up so it doesn't look like you copied anymore. <laughs> you are just copying... And he's like, okay, I'm going to change it to Zara. Like, dude, what? Yeah. Even before this whole fast fashion rhetoric of like, hey, knocking, like making off knockoff designs and stuff. Even before that happened, he was already making his company a knockoff company. (laughs) Yeah. So basically when he started Zorba, there was another, um, (laughs) there was another store or restaurant in Spain near him, which was already called Zorba, so he had to change his name mm-hmm. to Zara, which all of you guys probably have heard of by now. Mm-hmm. So what Ortega... Also the name of a friend. Shout out it's... Zara. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so Ortega would make, you know, seasonal collections of trendy knockoffs, which he produced in Spain. And then he decided to add quick response manufacturing. Since his market Mm -hmm. was domestic, so distances between his stores and, you know, manufacturing was short, he could get clothes to stores very quickly, he could sell them quickly, and he could restock almost instantly. Because of this, Zara was able to stop using seasons and instead drop new styles on sales floors constantly so that customers would come in more often because, you know, there was new stuff every time and they would go home with more. Ortega Mm -hmm. originally called it instant fashion, but we obviously know it as fast fashion today. Because don't we love that alliteration? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) That's definitely Um, why. I know. Okay, but like, we see this today in almost every store because, okay, I went to Macy's like a couple months ago, like obviously before quarantine and stuff. Um... And then I had to go return something. And it, Macy's looked completely different. And it's not like in the middle of a season. This was like spring to spring. <laughs> like, and it looked completely different. And I'm like, dude, what happened? Apparently it was just fast fashion. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I've ever walked into a Forever 21 and it looked even remotely similar to what it did even like a week before. Mm-hmm. And that's all thanks to Amancio Ortega. <laughs> So, while his brand was doing well already with, like, a new type of business model, he further mm-hmm. enhanced it by outsourcing his labor to Morocco, because labor was abundant and cheap there. And the factories were still close enough, so he could he still manage to have quality control over it, and a rapid delivery was possible, meaning he made way more profits than traditional fashion brands. Like, Gap or Tommy Hilfiger. Mm-hmm. 
Zara, it they focus on selling clothing cheaply, but they still manage to attain a sizable profit because they outsource production to independently owned factories in developing nations where there is little or no safety and labor oversight and wages are generally poverty level or lower. Because he started this new trend of, you know, outsourcing production using quick response manufacturing, a lot of companies like Gap, Urban Outfitters, H&M, and Benetton took notice and began doing the same thing. They would take designs from designer brands, use their own styles, and made them with worse quality, but lower prices to the middle market consumer. So people, you know, like you and me, would be more inclined to buy them because there's still styles that we appreciate and like because, you know, celebrities have similar styles, but they're made Mm -hmm. cheaply so that we can still afford them. That's interesting because, okay, so I think I did like a brief presentation about fast fashion in my global politics class. And um, uh, our teacher, he brought up this idea of uh, t-shirt economic theory. Um, And I just pulled up an article really quickly and I'm like skimming through it right now. (laughs) But essentially, (laughs) I know this is like really in advanced research. Do you see this? Like, I'm so prepared. (laughs) So prepared. Um, so, like, obviously, workers are paid different wages in different countries. However, the scale of, um, like, diversion in this, like, divergence in v- wages can be, like, super surprising. Um, because, like, the richer countries, obviously, you have to pay more because the expectation is higher. The quality of life is higher. Um, just, like, the lifestyle expectations in general are higher. But then in, I would say, like, lesser well-off or, like, poorer countries, um, Mainstream economic theory, I guess, it kind of justifies the whole paying them less by arguing that workers in richer countries are, like, more productive than poorer ones, which I think is not true, obviously. Um, And it argues that, like, the former are, like, are more educated and skilled, um, and they work, like, higher levels of technology. Um, And... The argument that my teacher, ma- not necessarily made, but like he brought up, was that fast fa- the fast fashion industry in general helps these workers, especially like farm laborers and stuff, who aren't necessarily making as much from the agriculture industry and like helping them get higher wages in manufacturing and stuff because of that. Like they help retrain and stuff and then you get higher wages. But... I think, like, while having higher wages from the industry is better, it still, like, points out it's still, like, not enough to live a decent life, right? You're not going to get everything. Like, people are struggling to make ends meet. And it's, like, not only does it point out how messed up the fashion, fast fashion industry is, but also how messed up the agriculture industry is. Like Essentially. I mean, you have to be pretty messed up in order to be worse than fast fashion. (laughs) That's saying quite a lot. (laughs) And one of the biggest issues with fast fashion, along with obviously labor issues, is actually environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So climate change is obviously a huge concern in our our current society. And I don't think a lot of people know that fast fashion is actually a large contributor to that. For example, okay. conventionally mm-hmm. grown cotton is one of the one of agriculture's most polluting crops. One kilogram of hazardous pesticides is required to grow just one hectare of cotton. And you can imagine how much cotton is used for clothing. Yeah. Definitely a lot. <laughs> yeah. I mean the World Bank actually estimates that fashion is responsible for nearly twenty percent of all industri- of all in <laughs> of all industrial water pollution w- worldwide 20 go. <laughs> just from fashion not even that's agriculture that's so much that is so much yeah not to mention that fast fashion even releases 10% of carbon ish- emissions in our air there's cars all over the world and yet fast fashion is releasing 10% of those emissions. 
It's interesting because, like, in your consumerism, obviously there, or, like, in someone's consumerism, obviously there's, like, multiple aspects, and you're like, oh, look, packaging, that's not sustainable. I'm not going to, like, buy this super plastic product or whatever. Um, But I guess, like, especially with my clothing, I never considered the environmental implications of it. I just kind of assumed, like, fabric is fabric, you know? (laughs) Um, And, like, obviously, labor... I guess labor violations are kind of well known at this point, especially with like factories in Bangladesh, Mm -hmm. Bangladesh and stuff. I guess um, I just didn't realize that like this shirt that I'm wearing right now that our audience cannot see because it's a podcast. Um, (laughs) But like it's a flannel shirt, but like you just never realize how much water is involved with this, how Mm -hmm. much plastic is actually in this shirt. And And even with that, like, you would never consider that your shirt is responsible for releasing carbon emissions and greenhouse gases into the air. Mm -hmm. I mean, one kilogram of cloth generates 23 kilograms of greenhouse gases. Whoa, that is so much. Yeah. And I mean, one kilogram of clothes, there's no way that includes your entire closet. Oh, yeah, definitely not. (laughs) Not to mention that, like, fast fashion also pollutes water sources. So, synthetic fabrics will release microfibers into the ocean, into water, when they're washed. Up to 40% of these microfibers enter rivers, lakes, and oceans. And this is often eaten by sea animals and makes its way to humans when we eat them. I mean, in 2016... Almost 90% of fresh and seawater samples tested contain microfibers, meaning that when we eat seafood, we're eating microfibers in those animals. This is why I'm vegan. (laughs) Or (laughs) trying to be. And this is why I'm vegan. (laughs) Which is like, okay, but seriously, okay. Wow, like, just the implications of one small choice just like goes to show how much our consumerism plays a big role in shaping Mm -hmm. our future yeah like microfibers yeah and while we obviously can't just stop buying clothes i think that i wonder why (laughs) yeah i wonder why that's an issue what we could stop is throwing away as many clothes as we do In Mm -hmm. the last 20 years, the amount of clothes Americans have thrown away has doubled from 7 million to 14 million tons. That's 80 pounds per person per year. You don't imagine throwing away Mm -hmm. 80 pounds of clothes. I didn't even think of my clothing in, like, pounds. Exactly. (laughs) You would think about it in, like, ounces or something. Exactly. And I'm fairly sure my closet is probably a lot more than that. Yeah. Which is like, whoa. (laughs) And the worst part is a lot of those clothing are taken to Africa, where it's often sold at a discount price. For example, a pair of jeans will run $1.50. That's it. In US value? Yes. Whoa. (laughs) That's so cheap. Okay, but, like, I would assume there would be a lot of economic implications because that means, like, Mm -hmm. any, like, African companies producing clothes in Africa, they obviously have, like, higher costs and stuff as opposed to, like, recycled jeans from Goodwill. Mm -hmm. Like, you might think that, you know, oh, we're giving our clothing to Africa. That should be a good thing. But these Mm -hmm. clothes have actually destroyed Africa's apparel business that the East African community has actually adopted, has actually asked to adopt a three-year phase out of the importation of hand-me-downs. Because there's just that many, that much clothing being sent to Africa. Which I think also plays into, like, the whole, like, philanthropic rhetoric and, like, how that's not necessarily as rosy or as good as we make it out to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when we give our clothing to Goodwill or something, we think it's a good thing. But, I mean, one Salvation Army 
creates 18 tons of unwanted clothing every three years. 18 tons. <laughs> and the majority of the clothing that these charities can't sell are given to material developers, and most of it ends up being burned or thrown in a landfill because they're trash. They can't do anything with them. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming, like, a lot of the materials from fast fashion are non-biodegradable, which I guess would still contribute to climate change even more. Yeah. <laughs> there really is no, you know, upside to this. Mm-hmm. 87% of all fabric used for clothing ends up incinerated or in a landfill. Wow, that makes me feel low-key bad about, like, buying new clothes now. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like every time, if I were to tell this to someone, they would automatically respond with, oh, but I donate it. Yeah, and it's kind of like, yeah, that's kind of the problem. Like, that is, that's obviously better than straight up throwing it up, just throwing it away, but it's probably going to end up in mm-hmm. the same place. Mm-hmm. So, real quick, you said in 2016, the East African community, they wanted to adopt a three-year phase to, like, phase out the importation of, like, hand-me-downs. Yeah. How did that work for them? So, when they decide to say that, when they decide to, like, you know, declare that they were wanting to op- opt out, Trump mm-hmm. actually threatened to launch a trade war. So, eventually, the EIC backed down. They couldn't do anything about it. Why am I not even surprised? <laughs> this man launches a war. Like, I launch insults towards my sister. <laughs> there was nothing they could do to get out of it, essentially. Yeah. And it's kind of like, it also plays a big role into, like, the interdependence um, economically. Because, obviously, like, if this trade war was launched, not only would the East African com- um, community be affected by it, but the rest of the world as well. Yeah. Like, it seems like places like Africa are becoming, like, a common dumping ground, you know? Mm -hmm. And then that also has, like, major implications on their tourism and their economy and all of that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, can we not? (laughs) Like, in the most simplest terms, can we just not? If only. (laughs) And, like, all of the clothing that you buy, Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize the materials that they're made out of. It's not just cotton. Cotton uses a lot of water for sure. But at least it's yeah. just water. Water doesn't just go away. Mm-hmm. I think the issue is when things like... So, you know poly- polyester, nylon, and spandex? Yeah. They, they're essentially made out of oil. To the extent that they use almost 342 million barrels of oil per year. Oil? Yeah. So now we're lining, like, the pockets of, what's his name? Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? <laughs> yeah, basically. Because <laughs> he obviously needs more money. Mm-hmm. That's the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, by the way, for those of you that don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but oil. Dude, I didn't even... <laughs> Your shirt. <laughs> I know. I, I keep forgetting that this is a podcast, so yeah. people can't see what I'm doing, but I'm just, like, pointing, I'm, like, heavy gestures towards my shirt right now. <laughs> I mean, at least your shirt probably isn't made out of spandex, but, like, leggings. Yeah. Le- yeah. Um, like, this entire, I, this obsession with, like, Lululemon and stuff like that. Yeah. It's made out of oil. <laughs> <laughs> and oil isn't even the worst material in clothing. There's another material called viscose which is used a lot in fast fashion, 33% uh-huh. of viscose in clothes is made from ancient or threatened forests. Okay, hold up. There's something worse than oil? <laughs> Apparently. Right? Like, okay. How, okay, do you ever just, like, take a step back and wonder, how is everything so messed up? <laughs> Every day. (laughs) Now I think that every time I open up my closet. (laughs) My my closet really just guilt tripping me right now. Yeah, basically. (laughs) Okay, but like, um, when you mean like ancient or threatened forests, do you mean like deforestation? Fast fashion contributes a lot to deforestation, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I know we've been having, so, like, obviously that was a really good explanation of, like, what's going on environmentally, because there were so many things that I didn't consider, um, especially with, like, a simple t-shirt or, like, a simple pair of leggings or jeans. For sure. And I know we brought up, like, labor um, and labor rights a lot, but do you want to, like, go ahead and talk about, like, why these practices are super unethical or like why we need to focus on that aspect yeah sure so fashion is one of the biggest industries in the world with one out of six people being employed by fashion it's the most labor intensive industry though and Mm -hmm. the biggest issue is that less than two percent of these workers earn a living wage not to mention that most of these workers are women or some boys and girls whoa okay just looking at neighbor like number wise you said one out of six people right yeah considering that the world's population is like what seven billion let's say six billion because (laughs) i can't math in my head like that okay so So at least a billion people in the fashion industry at least and if that's only less than two percent yeah dude Again, how is everything so messed up? <laughs> and, okay, if only, if less than 2% earn a living wage, you have to, like, wonder what the conditions are for those who don't. Like, the 98%. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay, continue. So, well, obviously, countries like the U.S. have a lot of regulations put in place to keep workers safe. Many developing countries, such as Bangladesh, don't have those strict labor laws. Mm-hmm. Lots of companies, such as J. Crew, have faced a lot of charges pertaining to employee mistreatment because of the lax labor laws in a lot of these countries. Huh. I mean, I guess that would make sense as to like why they're outsourcing these jobs in the first place, yeah. as opposed to like hiring workers in America in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So one of the worst countries when it comes to labor rights is Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So they're the second biggest apparel producer in the world, just after China, which is insane to think about considering the size difference between China and Bangladesh. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't expect that. Mm -hmm. But the reason it's one of the biggest apparel producers is that it's one of the cheapest places in the world to make clothing. The reason is because of their very lenient labor laws. They've had a history of factory fires and disasters, which brands are doing very little about. The biggest issue is that a lot of executives of these companies legitimately don't know what's happening because, you know, they offshore their production and they can't always do quality control checks. Mm -hmm. So because they don't know about this stuff, they can often get out of legal trouble. And that's the reason brands haven't done much for it. Dude, why does this remind me of, like, in AP U.S. history last year, we talked about, like, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, where they had, like, so many issues with, like, just labor, like, working conditions in general, where when the, Mm -hmm. like, factory fire just kind of, like, happened, so many workers, especially women, were put, like, in danger. And, like, that's what caused... Or that's what kind of, like, fueled a lot of changes in American labor laws. But it's insane how, like, that, so, that kind of change still hasn't taken place in other countries, such as Bangladesh. Mm-hmm. Well, there was actually a similar incident in Bangladesh called the really? Rana Plaza incident. Have you heard about it? I haven't, no. Do tell. So basically, in 2013... The year which basically everything seemed to have happened. I don't know what's up with that. I know. Okay. (laughs) This is like unrelated. There's like a random theory that we switched between parallel universes or something because the world was ending in 2012. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Yeah. Okay. 2013. (laughs) Great segue there. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Basically in 2013, Workers at five manufacturers in Rana Plaza, which is an area in Bangladesh, Mm -hmm. were sewing when there was an explosion, which split the second floor wall apart like a fault line. Whoa. So obviously, with there being such a large explosion, everyone was sent home. 
Mm -hmm. But they were ordered to return just the next morning because they were told only the plaster on the wall was broken, so they didn't feel a reason that the workers should stay home for longer. Hold up. There was an explosion, and the workers had to come back? The next day. Regardless of, like, what happened with labor, like, the working conditions and stuff, there was an explosion. Mm -hmm. The end. That should be the end of the story, (laughs) but no. Instead, the next day, the power went out. Of course it did. in and of itself, isn't a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody expected any issues, and the workers weren't told to stop working because the generators were supposed to start. They started a few minutes later... But because of that, the concrete ceiling fell. Oh my god. There were thousands of people in that building working. And -hmm. because of that explosion and the concrete ceiling falling, 1,134 people were dead. And 2,500 more were injured. Making it one of the deadliest factory incidents in history. And has there been any kind of, like, consequences? Well, originally, no brands stepped forward to say they were manufacturing there. Even though more than a dozen U.S. and European brands' clothes were made there, but most of them dodged calls for compensation to victims' families and survivors because they claimed their orders had been subcontracted to Rana Plaza without the company knowing. Dude, that's the worst way to be like, we're not taking ownership of this. That's so messed up. Like, having a fan, like, just being in one of those families, right, and telling them, like, their death wasn't worth it. Like, oh, we just messed up clerically. Basically. (sighs) I mean, because there was no worker rights agreements in place in Bangladesh, there was no obligation for these companies to pay. And if there's no legal obligation... We know that corporations aren't going to take out money from their company to give it to people. Yeah. I mean, I think we also explored that in, like, specific to the U.S., but, like, the private prison industry, our last episode. Go check that out if you haven't. Um, I don't know, just, like, adding promo in there in the middle of, like, a really serious discussion. (laughs) Yeah, always. (laughs) (laughs) Self-promo. But, yikes, like... Yeah, companies never, almost never own up. It's almost like when there are no regulations, companies don't necessarily set themselves to a higher standard. Like, that's how the model of capitalism is supposed to work, where the markets markets kind of regulate each other. But it seems like companies are just kind of like, hey, so can we all take our standard of working just lower? <laughs> Essentially. Because, I mean, that's kind of how this industry keeps working Mm -hmm. so while this was obviously a terrible incident there was one good thing that came out of it okay within the next six weeks of the incident 43 companies came forward and signed the accord on fire and building state safety so in this they detailed regulations of a sort that you know the factories that they manufactured in had to follow However, Mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of actual legal enforcement put on this. So if a company violated it, they were kind of condemned, but there wasn't a lot of legal obligation for them to face repercussions. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So while a lot of factories in Bangladesh did improve, there was a huge improvement in a lot of these factories, but there's still sweatshops in Bangladesh. At these Mm -hmm. sweatshops... There's still teenage girls working there, child laborers. There's weak lighting. Almost all of the workers are barefoot. Mm -hmm. There's a severe lack of safety equipment with almost no face masks. There's exposed wiring, broken windows, and the temperature can exceed over 100 degrees in these factories. And I'm assuming, like, all of those have significant, like, effects on... Not only, like, their work output, but also, like, their health and, um, like, Definitely. probably an extremely, extremely increased rate of, like, injury at workplaces. Mm-hmm. Oh, my Another God. Another good thing that did come out of this accord and mm-hmm. the incident was that 
Bangladesh's workers in the fashion industry had their wages slightly increased. Originally, it was um, less than $70 per month. Okay. Oh my god, how? So it was eventually increased to around $95. That's still not a lot. It's not. (laughs) It's still less than, I believe, half the living wage. Yeah. I mean, how much is like an average monthly salary? Like 50000 in the U.S. is like an annual, so that's like, what, 4000 Yeah. Yeah, 4000ish per month. Oh my, and... and the minimum wage is, what, close to $9 an hour? I think so. Don't, I, I'm not sure about that one. Because <laughs> it's, it's like obviously different in different places. I heard 15 last, but... I'm not sure whether no, that's, like, what it should be raised to. is what to. they're trying to increase it to. Yeah, okay, okay. So it's, like, nine. <laughs> um, that's, like, what, nine per hour? per hour. So 40 hours a week, 360 times around four weeks. Yeah, I mean, that's still significantly that's more than... already more. Okay, like, that's per... a lot more. <laughs> like, if it's nine dollars, it would take you, what, ten hours to work the same amount that you would have exactly. to, like, for a month in the fast fashion industry. I mean, in their defense, it is cheaper. Like, the living wage is lower mm-hmm. in Bangladesh than the U.S., but $95 is still way less than what the living wage is. And these people, they're working often more than eight hours a day, so it's not like they can get multiple jobs. Yeah, I mean, it takes a lot of time, I assume, to make something like a shirt. Yeah. Um, do you know when this was enacted? Um, the accord? Yeah. It was within six weeks of the Rana Plaza incident, so in 2013. Okay, isn't it, like, insane that this bad of, like, a natural disaster had to occur at this point? factory in order to like enact legislation that seems like it normally would have been without this sort of thing only seven years ago i know and i think it's important to like look at how much we take for granted i mean obviously like i I don't want to turn this into like oh my god you know appreciate the world that we live in because (laughs) Like, like the stereotypical thing about, like, when you waste your food or whatever. I'm not going to do that thing. But it's <laughs> insane because it's like we have a lot more protections in terms of labor laws that contribute to our quality of life. See, it's interesting that you say that because a lot of companies have been trying to produce more apparel in the U.S., you know, because a lot of consumers like seeing that their favorite brands manufacturing clothing here huh for example los angeles is actually america's largest apparel manufacturing center Mm -hmm. which seems like a good thing obviously there's more regulation so people should be safer however there's several sweatshops in la seriously about half the workers are recorded as workers and they're paid minimum wage like they should be Mm -hmm. but the other half are undocumented and work for as little as $4 an hour with no overtime, no health benefits, and in horrendous conditions. It's, that's insane because you normally wouldn't associate like that type of lifestyle with, I guess, what Mm -hmm. LA, like the image of the US in general, but specifically with LA, like that's not necessarily what you associate it with. And despite these conditions, these U.S. sweatshops get made in the USA, printed on their clothes to pander to consumers' patriotism, while continuing to break U.S. labor laws. So they get that whole sort of sticker of approval, while not actually, you know, adhering to any of the regulations that the USA is supposed to be known for. That has a lot to do with, like, image in general. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I think um, I've seen a little bit about this in the media, but like also greenwashing with environmentalism, like 
companies are like, oh, you know, we're super sustainable. We use, we're like contributing, we're trying to work on like a less carbon emission. So this is our green line. And it's like, even your green line still contributes to a lot of carbon emission and pollution. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, there are all these stickers of approval that we give certain products when measuring like whether we want to put our or invest money into them. Right. I think brands have started to know, notice that like, especially people in, you know, the millennial generation or the jet or in Gen Z have started to care a lot more about regulations and labor laws. So, Mm -hmm. and, you know, environmentalism, obviously. So companies have started to take notice and have been trying to supposedly, you know, adhere to these regulations. While in reality, many of them are just kind of putting up a facade. Where yeah. they say that it's better, but in reality, the conditions are pretty much the exact same. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting how, like, our, I guess, biases are, like, our ethical biases in a way. Um, it's interesting to see how the, that those are kind of being exploited against us, right? Even though you think, like, oh, I am, like, this person who's, like, super like an environmentalist and stuff like that and i'm gonna do anything i can to kind of stop so sustainable line but like in essence that's being used against you your money is going to a big corporation that's probably contributing more to climate change yeah and these like labor and ethical issues so i know you mentioned a little bit about like wearing your clothes longer um And I guess, like, the other alternative that I've heard a little bit about is thrifting. But I've also heard that this is a little bit problematic. Okay. So for the most part, I think thrifting is generally a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because obviously you're buying clothes secondhand, which is one of the most sustainable options. Because you're not actually purchasing a new piece of clothing. Instead, you're helping a person to make the most out of their clothing. Right. The issue behind it is that this is kind of causing gentrification of a sort Mm -hmm. because, you know, the people who thrift and actually rely on thrifting just to get the clothes that they need to, you know, have an acceptable amount of clothes, they rely on these on thrift stores and yet a lot of younger people are using thrift stores just so they can get more clothes and, you know, fit in or whatever when they should be, when they have the money to buy clothes from, you know, stores with higher prices, but they just don't because thrifting is cheaper. And the real issue with that is because more people are buying thrift stores from, or more people are thrifting, demand for thrifted clothes goes up, meaning that prices go up. So the people who actually needed thrifting to just survive may not have the money for it. And then that also gets rid of the choice that they have within these thrift stores because, like, you're obviously taking more product away from them. And it's not like thrift stores produce, like, they don't produce any product. They're not, like, getting local shipments every single day. It's, like, whatever just is donated to these thrift stores. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's, like, why I say the best thing you can do to fight fast fashion is simply to wear your clothes longer. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Just try to buy, you know, maybe less clothing or buy the types of clothing that you'll be able to wear for a long period of time. So Mm -hmm. not, like, you know, the type of clothing from Forever 21, which is going to rip within a week. Exactly. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Or, like... Whatever you can do to kind of avoid lining the pockets of these types of companies so that, like, that kind of economic incentive, I guess, pushes them to adopt the necessary practices so that we can eventually get to a point where we can buy from Forever 21 ethically. At the same time, though, Mm -hmm. I think it is cognizant to acknowledge the fact that worrying about fast fashion and sustainability is a very first world and elitist problem it definitely is um because not everyone has the luxury to think about the materials that they buy because obviously like i was on the internet the other day trying to find like sustainable or like fashion companies or brands that don't involve like 
ethical considerations mm-hmm. and environmental like <laughs> negative environmental implications um but it's so hard and even when i found one they were super expensive yeah i know one of the most common sustainable brands which people mm-hmm. like to talk about is reformation yeah which I've heard is of that a good brand because you know they try to sustainably produce their you know clothing mm-hmm. but th- like a dress is two hundred dollars <laughs> Exactly. I'm not gonna, like, I think it's the balance of where convenience and um, mainly economic convenience kind of contributes to our econ- our decisions more than, like, um, whatever we can see in the future. Because we talk about this in my psychology class a little bit, um, where it's kind of like your, the impacts or, like, the effects and outcomes of a decision that are more current or more short term uh kind of draw you towards making a choice as opposed to like the long-term impacts right especially for like people who like younger people because their brains are like not fully developed yet that kind of choice seems most appealing i mean it's true though like anybody the majority of people if they're gonna see like two pieces of clothing which look very similar, but one of them's for $10 and the other one's for 50 Which one are you going to buy? I know. Um, probably the $10 one. And even, like, if you look at what goes into these clothing and you're like, oh, I'm going to take the time to compare which one is better for the environment, <laughs> like, you're not going to do that. And that's partly because this information isn't very well known, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know oil or viscosine was in my... Or viscose. Is that viscose or viscosine? Viscose, yeah. Viscose, yeah. I didn't know, like, oil and viscose were in my clothing. Like, this is stuff I'm wearing right now. Yeah. And it's like, you don't necessarily know about it unless you take the time to learn about it. Which I think is, like, the biggest theme throughout our episodes. Like, make sure, like, not only is it what we're saying, but in general. Make sure to research about these things because... There are so many implications that you don't necessarily realize exist. Mm-hmm. Again, at the end of the day, there's not just one solution which is going to fix every problem with the fast fashion industry. Mm-hmm. Fast fashion is not just going to disappear. Yeah. <laughs> Nor should it. Because Absolutely it is helpful not. to people. Mm-hmm. Especially in those developing countries, like fast fashion is providing jobs. It's providing areas of economic development that contribute to those countries' economies. Especially because, like, like I'm assuming in Bangladesh, um, it contributes a significant amount to their like GDP. Yeah. Right. I mean, um, it's their biggest industry in the country. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I will say though, China is interesting to look at because anything that comes from the fast fashion industry in China, I think, they rely heavily on labor of Uyghurs. And for those of you who don't know, um, the Uyghur genocide crisis is a thing in China where um, the Chinese government is kind of taking this Muslim minority, this cultural Muslim minority, uh, the Uyghurs, and putting them in detention camps or like concentration camps. This is very similar to the practices adopted um, by Nazi Germany to kind of oppress the Jew- Jewish people. So obviously, like, there are so many concerns. And it's not like we can't tell you, oh, avoid this specific brand or avoid these brands. Because almost every single brand has it, right? More than 90 brands rely on manufacturing from Uyghurs. So mm-hmm. it's not a kind of thing that you can just avoid. Exactly. It's kind of like... Honestly, the best solution, I would think, is we need to hold these companies to a higher standard, right? Yeah. I'm not saying Forever 21, die, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, although it would seem that way because it seems like they're kind of declining in the industry. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to tell Zara to just, you know, shut down all of its production because that's just not reasonable. They're the biggest, Inditex is the biggest apparel producer in the world. We can't mm-hmm. just shut them down completely that's not a reasonable solution nor should we i mean like obviously economic development and stuff like that but um just hold holding them to a higher standard whether that might be imposing Mm -hmm. government regulations just like 
in a way, coercing them economically. That's probably yeah. the most sig- – because money – is what drives a lot of motivation for these companies. Like, that's why they choose cheaper labor. That's why they choose cheaper materials, right? And we can refrain from that aspect of consumerism and be like, hey, we're going to make an ethical choice to do something else today when we can, right? I'm not saying, like, do it if you can't afford it. But if you can, it's definitely the best way to go about making meaningful change. And while, again, we're not just going to be able to, you know, email a company and suddenly they're going to, you know, update all of their regulations, we can still make the conscious decision every day just to, you know, not throw out a piece of clothing that you could wear for another year. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Exactly. And in general, just paying attention to consumerism, like our consumerist practices and like what we're actually getting out of what we're buying and what goes into what we're buying. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest takeaway. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. I know um, this one was a lot more fun to talk about, not because like we talk about the world burning and like a bunch (laughs) of labor and ethical issues. Yeah, yeah. that's definitely Um, not why. (laughs) That's not the fun part, but it was just fun to like talk about something that is a little bit more mainstream um, that both of us knew about a significant amount, like a significant (laughs) amount. Yeah, this was a really great conversation, in my opinion. If you guys have any comments or have anything to share about fast fashion, Feel free to, you know, say anything to us on our Instagram at Positionality Media or email us at positionalitymedia at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, tune in next time where we're still going to decide what episode topic we're going to do. But um, <laughs> yeah, we'll have one episode out next week. So come back. Hopefully. Bye. <laughs> See you guys. <laughs>